good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and for some of you, good morning. Um, my name is Cynthia Holt, and I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, who is sponsoring um, this session. And um, I would like to start by acknowledging that Call CBA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunutsiavut and Nunukkudavut, uh, the Innu of Natasanan, the Beotic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulastokiuk, the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at Call CBWA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, so once again, welcome, and I'm going to turn the session over now to our moderator for today, Louise McGillis. Louise. Thank you, Cynthia, for the um, territorial acknowledgement. So good afternoon. My name is Louise Gillis, and I'm the Research Data Management Librarian at Dalhousie. On behalf of CAL CBUA, the Digital Preservation Stewardship Committee, and our partners ACENET and Andrea Portage, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 CAL CBUA Research Data Management Series. The francization of the event is made possible through the collaboration of the members of the Research Data Management Working Group at the Bureau de la Cooperation Interuniversitaire. Special thanks to our organizers, Margaret Vale, Cynthia Lise, Cynthia Holt, Aaron McPherson. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, all good? Um, Alison Farrell, Lydia Fermaiden, uh, Jennifer Abel, Jonathan Dory, and Victoria Volkanova. This session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the CAUL CPUA website. During the presentation, we ask that all attendees mute their microphones. We'll give everyone a chance to do that and turn off their webcams. You can access the controls for your camera and microphone at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical problems, please put them in the chat box during the main presentation. Please remember to be kind, courteous and respectful of the presenters and other attendees. I'd now like to introduce Allison Farrell, who will be speaking on RDM basics. Allison is a research data management and public services librarian at the Health Sciences Library at Memorial University. Allison plays an active role in furthering RDM services and supports at Memorial. In addition, Allison is leading the development of Memorial's RDM institutional strategy and sits on a number of national committees in different areas of RDM. So I'll hand it over to you, Allison. Great. Thanks very much, Louise. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Okay, you can see that screen in PowerPoint presentation. Excellent. I'm going to take that as yes. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction, Louise. As she said, my name is Allison Farrell, um, and I've been working in RDM for about five years, I would say. So I still feel like a newbie in this field, um, but I, I know there's just a lot to know, and I still feel like I'm learning things every day. Um, so today I'm going to look, we're going to look at RDM basics. So what you need to know. So we're going to look a little bit about what research data management is, why you need to care about what research data management is and how to do it. Um, a little bit about the federal landscape and the new tri-agency research data management policy that has come out just recently in March of this year. We're also going to look at the FAIR principles and how to make your data FAIR. Um, and then we'll end with looking at some national and local resources that are available to you. So let's start with what is research data management? So essentially, data research data management concerns the entire, the organization of your data right from the beginning of your research project in your planning of your research project, right through to the dissemination and archiving of valuable results. So it aims to make sure that your data is reliable so that it can be verified, um, so that your data is reliable, so your results are reliable, um, and it permits the usage of 
or it permits new and innovative research built on that existing data. So you don't necessarily need to share your data with the world, but it is a good idea to plan your data because it'll cut down on a lot of time and frustration for you during your research project. Just as you would create a research proposal at the very beginning of a research project, it's a good idea to plan what you're gonna do with your data and how you're gonna manage that throughout the whole cycle. So one of the reasons you really wanna care about this, um, back in 2016, there was a MUN student who went to his office one day and opened the door to find that his office had been broken into and his laptop and his external hard drive had both been stolen. Mm -hmm. This is where he kept his thesis and all of the data that went with his thesis. So essentially two years of work had been lost. He had had it up on Dropbox, um, but he had just removed it from Dropbox recently to make room for other files. So he contacted Dropbox. They, they only have a 30 day recovery. So I still have not been actually able to find out whatever happened to him. Um, I never heard if he actually got his data back or not. I know he had put out a reward for $1,500 for either his laptop or the hard drive or even just the data that was on it. Um, so it's a huge issue. And this, I mean, you know, this this really impacted his life and, and totally deleted two years of work that had happened. So you really need to make sure that you have good secure security and backup of your data. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But that's really one of the reasons, just one of them, that you want to really care about uh, data management. So why else would you want to man manage your research data? Well, it's good practice and it's practical. It will help keep you organized. Uh, it helps new people when they join your research team or join their lab. They can understand your data. Uh, it helps you know what your data means when you return to it after a period of time. So we all know you might start a research project and then you get busy. Life happens, teaching happens, um, other service commitments happen, and you might be go six months without looking at your data and you go back and you go, ah, oh, what did that variable mean? What did I mean when I wrote that little tiny note? So it's a good idea to document what you're doing with your data, where you're putting it, what your variables mean, all of that kind of stuff. It's going to help you in the long run. It's also going to help other people understand your data. If you decide to share your data um, at the end of your project, it will help other people understand how they can use that data and how they can build upon it. It's also going to help you with your versioning and knowing which data is which. You know, you're going to have multiple copies of your data. Probably you're going to have your raw data, your analyzed data, uh, maybe your cleaned data, your anonymized data, all kinds of different data sets really that are from this one data set. So it's going to help you understand which is the most current data set and which data is which. Another reason you're going to want to manage your research data is because it's required for a lot of grants and funding applications or funding opportunities. More altruistically and community minded, there are a lot of research data management drivers. So a lot of the money that researchers are getting from the tri agencies all of that money is public funds. So the public really wants to know what is happening to all of that money. All this money we pay our taxes for, it goes to research. What's happening? Um, sorry, can I just ask that people mute their microphones? Thanks. Um, it's going to help with improving the discoverability and accessibility of data sets. Um, so you know, you might not want to actually go out and collect your own data. You might want to use somebody else's data. So if you when you do collect your own data and you make use of your own research data and if you document that well and you end up sharing that, other people are going to be able to use your data and extend your research. Um, they might get in touch with you to um, collaborate on your research. So it's going to build more relationships as well. It supports replicability. And I know in the sciences, that's a huge problem right now. Um, but if you share your data with others, then you can look and they can look at it and they can reproduce that same data set or they can reproduce um, a different data set but with the same methodology to see if, you know, if they get the same results that you got. Um, we don't want to collect the same data over and over again. If there's multiple people working on the same type of topic, if there's already a data set out there that they can use, you know, say you went and got um, a bunch of temperature readings from the month of September in a particular location and someone else has the same interest in that, they don't have to go and do the same thing. They could use your data. It helps with the verification of your own research results, so it'll help in peer review. 
if people have your data set to look at when they're reviewing your research, they can say, does this data, does do these results make sense from this data? Um, there's a lot of requirements from journals and funders to manage your data well and potentially to make that data accessible to others. Really, it's it's for the public good. Sharing data, having good data management, um, taking control of this data makes for better research and it aligns with international best practices and standards. A lot of the funding opportunities in the UK and in the US already have these um, requirements that you need to either share your data or you need to have a data management plan. We'll talk about that in a little in a few minutes. Um, so it's just aligning with all of these international best practices. So what's going on in Canada right now? I mentioned that the UK and the US already have a lot of funder uh, requirements. We did not have those funder requirements until recently. So about five years ago, the tri agencies came out with a statement of principles on digital data management. And essentially they talked about what they want to see researchers doing with their management or with their data, sorry. One of the basic premises of um, what the government would like us to do with our data is to make it as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. So we want to be able to share our data, acknowledging that there are a lot of instances where you just can't share data. You know, you can't share personal health information. You can't share information about endangered species, things like that. There's a lot of stuff that would not be able to share, be shared. But we want to make it as much data as we can make that be open and allow other researchers to use it and build upon it. So after this statement came out, um, a draft policy was released in 2018. Um, and that went through a number of consultations with research institutions, universities, colleges, um, researchers across the country. There was uh, probably six months of town halls. And they taught they got a lot of feedback on the draft policy. Um, and it was supposed to be released in 2020 and then COVID came along and changed priorities. Uh, so the final policy was released in 2021, in March of 2021. So now we're trying to uh, raise awareness about what this policy means for you, for researchers. So this is just a screenshot of the data management policy first page, the little preamble. Um, and you can see on the side over here, there is a link to the statement of principles on digital data management, if you'd like to go take a look at that. Um, and Louise, I'd ask you if you could pop the link to the policy in the chat there. If researchers want to go take a look at the policy in more detail. Um, there's also a summary of the public consultation, so you can see what the response was to the draft policy. And then there's a really, really good set of frequently asked questions on that site that explain the policy in more detail. The, the different elements of the policy explains it a little bit in more detail and kind of puts some context around the policy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit of, about the policy and what you need to know about the policy. So there's essentially three main elements that came out of this policy. The first is that every institution that receives tri-agency funds needs to create an institutional strategy of how they're going to support their researchers in research data management. So what services, what resources, what um, IT um, storage solutions will a, a university or a college have to support their researchers? Um, these all need to be created by March of 2023 and posted publicly and submitted to the tri agencies. So most of the institutions in the Atlantic Canada probably have a team that are working on putting together an institutional strategy right now. Um, and I suspect that you will see more about that from your own institution in the next uh, six months to a year. The second element of the policy looks at data management plans. So this is essentially a plan that you would do at the very beginning of your research project just to say how you're going to manage your data. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But what they're saying, what the tri agency is saying is that some grant funding opportunities will require data management plans be part of the application. They're not sure which uh, grants will require those right now, but by spring of 2022, the agencies will have set an initial um, set of funding opportunities that will require data management plans. And I suspect that going forward in time, more and more funding opportunities will require that data management plan. And it's going to be part of the adjudication process for awarding those grants. The third element in the policy is data deposit. 
So they're saying that any data that supports research conclusions, so anything that you say in a publication, any results you put in a publication, those the data supporting those conclusions must be deposited into a repository. And that has to be a, a repository that ensures safe storage, preservation, and curation of the data. So this does not mean that the data has to be shared or be open to the public, but it does need to be secure in a repository somewhere. The idea, if you're not sharing your data, is that the metadata, so the data about the data, will be available so everyone can see at least that this data set exists somewhere. And that would allow collaborators or potential collaborators to get in touch with the authors and say, hey, I'm interested in the same topic or I have a very similar data set, want to collaborate and we can push our research forward. Um, and the tri-agencies will phase this requirement in after reviewing the institutional strategies. So they're really not sure exactly what that element is going to, to be yet. They're going to review the strategies and then take another look at that. So the key takeaways that I see from the policy, um, one, it's really trying to create a culture of best practices in data management that include data sets as a research output. So not only when you go to P&T um, promotion and tenure committees, not only do research publications, so journal articles, books, reports, that kind of thing, not only do they count as research output, but the data sets behind those publications will also count as research outputs in the P&T process. Um, and that's because we all know, you know, you can spend a couple of years on a research project and maybe you only get one article out of that, but you've put so much work into collecting all of this data. So why shouldn't that data also be recognized? Because it can also be built upon by other researchers. So we want to create that culture of best practices in data management. One thing to really notice is this is a data management policy. It's not an open data policy. They are not requiring that data be shared openly. They are requiring that you manage it properly. And the other takeaway is that it is going to be an incremental policy and will include ongoing consultations with the research community. They really felt it was important to get researchers' opinions on the policy and it will be an iterative policy. Um, as you see, the grants that they decide need DMPs will be coming out this spring. Um, and then the data deposit, data deposit requirements will change over time as they review the strategies and there will be consultations going forward. So what does all that mean? How do you manage your data? How, are, how is this going to impact you? So one of the ways that you can look at data is to use these fair guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. And really, it's not just for scientific data. It's for all research data. So humanities, social sciences, science, health sciences, all of this can fit into these fair guiding principles. This was published in 2016 in the journal Scientific Data. Um, and Louise, if you want to pop in the link to the FAIR principles into the chat, that would be great. Thank you. So the authors wrote this to provide guidelines to assist in improving the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability of data. So ensuring your data is findable, how do you do that? Well, metadata. I mentioned before that metadata is essentially data about your data. So it's things like the title of your data set, um, where you collected the data, how you collected the data, who collected the data, so the creator of the data set, um, the date the data was collected, any keywords about the topic. So how would people find, you know, if you have an article that you're looking for, it's going to have keywords attached to it. And if you search those keywords, you'll find the article. We want the same thing to happen with data. So you want to describe your data according to an accepted metadata standard, and there are different standards in different, in different disciplines. Um, another way to ensure your data is findable is to put it into a data repository, specifically one that is aligned with the FAIR principles. And that could be either discipline specific or general, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. And you also want your data to have a unique and persistent identifier, like a digital object identifier or a DOI. And you may have seen those on journal articles. They're now being minted for data sets as well. And that means that if you have that, no matter where the data lives, it's always going to be findable if you use that DOI, because that's going to be a persistent identifier. So you want to make sure that your data is accessible, unlike the lighthouse in this picture. I couldn't actually find a good picture for accessible that wasn't um, like wheelchair accessibility or anything like that. So I picked the lighthouse. 
Um, again, your data is going to be accessible if you have really good metadata attached to it. You want to choose a repository that can read that metadata. Um, and you want to make sure that the metadata is accessible even if the data are not. You can also look at licenses. So, um, you know, your copyright licenses to put on your data if you want to make it open or not, and how you can authenticate the access to that data. So it might be that um, anyone can access the data. It's just open, it's out there, and it's a repository freely available. It might be that it's restricted to certain types of researchers, and that's really up to you as a researcher. You can restrict the data in however way, in whatever way you want. It could be that they have to go through an authentication process to get it. So it might be, you know, if you are with an affiliated university or research center, you're able to access the data, something like that. But you want it to be accessible. We also want it to be interoperable. And this kind of means it can be read by machines and humans. So again, it goes back to the metadata. If you have a metadata standard that um, is known and widely used in your field, then machines will be able to read that as well if you put the right words in the right fields. Um, you might want to reference it, reference other data or other metadata sets uh, or other data sets or other metadata in your, in your record of your data. Um, you want to use non-proprietary formats so that uh, people can open those data sets um, even if they don't have the proprietary software. So that might be rather than putting your data up in Excel in an Excel spreadsheet, you put it up in CSV file format so that the other researcher doesn't need to have Excel to be able to open that file. So it's interoperable with different software packages. And you want it to be well structured so that people can understand it and they can import it and use it with their own data sets. We also want the data to be reusable. So again, it goes back to metadata. Um, you want it to be very rich so that people can understand how you collected it, what that methodology was, um, where you collected it. If you have, if you were using um, slides of uh, organic material and you had to use a microscope to look at that, what settings was the microscope at? Um, because the data is not going to be useful if they don't know all that granular information. You want a clear license so that people know how they are allowed to use your data. Um, you want to document your data um, so that people understand their data. So, you know, what do the variables mean in each of your, uh, in your spreadsheet, in each column? Um, you want to create a data citation so that people know how to acknowledge that they've used your data. Um, and you want to link it to any related outputs. So if someone finds an article that you wrote, you want the data to be linked to that article um, so that they can go and then look at the data or vice versa. If someone finds a data set, they can go and look at your article to see what you did with that data, how you analyzed it and what results you came to or what conclusions you came to. You might also want to link it to um, a researcher ID like an ORCID. Uh, then you can link back to other teams. People can see who you've collaborated with. They can take a look at your own research history, your own research record. Um, that makes it a little bit more usable too because somebody might say, well, okay, yeah, there's this great data set, but I don't know anything about their research or I don't know their qualifications. So if they look at that uh, persistent ID, that ORCID, they might be able to see your research record, your history, and say, yeah, okay, I want to collaborate with that person, or yeah, I trust their data, that kind of thing. So you know you need to make your data fair. Okay, great. How do you do that? Well, there are a number of different ways that you can make your data fair. One of the biggest ways is organization. Organize your data. We all know we should be organizing our data. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. And how do we do that? We also need to document what you're doing with your data, how you're collecting it, where it lives, how it's backed up, who has access to it, who's responsible for it, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and metadata, we'll talk about that in a minute again. We've talked about it a lot already. Um, and by putting them in repositories so that people can find the data or at least find the metadata about the data. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a sec. So some best practices for organization. You want to think about naming conventions. So in every data file, you don't want just haphazard naming conventions saying um, uh, project data underscore November underscore Newfoundland. 
it doesn't really tell you much about the data. Um, you might want to create a naming convention that you have. OK, every data set is going to have um, the date and then it's going to have who collected it, the site it was collected at, uh, and then the particular species that it was collected on. So you want to document the naming convention. Um, and that means everyone on your team knows how to do it right and can find the right files when they're needed. You want to think about date conventions when you're naming your files. So 2020-1108, is that November 8th? Is that August 11th? We don't really know. So you want to write down what your date conventions are and stick to that. If you do it year, month, day, um, then all of your files will arrange themselves chronologically on your computer. And I find that the easiest way to um, arrange my, my files and use the date, the date conventions. Um, I know, and then this gets a little bit difficult if you're working in a large team and everybody has their own way of doing that. So it's really important that you get that written down at the very beginning and you figure out and you agree on what date convention you're going to use for your files. You want to think about how you're going to structure the organization of your files. So your folder structure, your file structure. You want to think about who on your team has access to what files and what data sets. Not everybody on the team is going to be to have access to every file that you create or have access to. There might be some sensitive information in there that only the PI can access. So you want to document which files or folders which people on your team can access. You also want to think about backup and storage. So there is the 321 rule for backup and storage. Um, so that means you want to have one original copy of your data. Uh, you want it to be stored in two locations. And now I'm blanking on what the third, what the three is. You want three copies of your data, one original one, and it has to be in at least two different locations. So when we go back to look at that Mun student that had his data all on his hard drive and his external drive, that was great that he backed it up, but they were both in the same location. So when his office was broken into, all of his data was gone. So it would have been a good idea for him to possibly have it on another external drive that he took with him he took, or kept at home or something like that. This can sometimes result in a little bit of confusion about which ones are the most recent um, copies of the data, because if you have three copies of your data, you're going to want to back all of them up at the same time, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. So if you're using some, some of your institutional storage and it is on a networked server, you just want to check out, do they already take care of the backup? Maybe you don't have to have a, three copies of your data if they already have a backup copy of the data um, with your IT services. You do want to have a schedule for backing up your data, and that's going to vary depending on how much you touch your data, how much you analyze your data. It might be you back it up at the end of every day. It might be you back it up at the end, end of every week or once a month, something like that, depending on how much you're going in and changing things. But you want to definitely have a schedule for doing that and have that written down so that everyone on your team knows when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. So documentation and metadata. I've talked a lot about metadata so far, and this is really the information about your data that anyone, other researchers or you or anyone on your team is going to need to understand how to use the data, where to find the data, how it was collected, all of that kind of thing. So different disciplines have different standards. For example, um, biological sciences would use Darwin Core as it has fields for things like species, genre, family, that kind of thing. You want to create a readme file that goes with your data and lives with your data and is backed up along with your data. So that would include things like the title of your project, a little bit of a description about what your project entails, um, information about the methodology of how you collected your data. Um, it could be the location of your data and how it's backed up and when it's backed up. It could be who's responsible for the data. Uh, generally, the PI is ultimately responsible for that, but you might have um, a data manager on your team that is responsible for the backup and storage of your data. So you want to write all of that down and keep that with your data. 
that makes it easier for you to understand your data. It makes it easier for people on your team to understand your data, and it makes it easier for any other researchers that are going to use your data to understand your data. And then there's DMPs. So that's a data management plan. And a data management plan, as I mentioned earlier, is a formal document that kind of details what you're going to do with your data to effectively manage it throughout the active phase of your research and then throughout the preserving part of your research and sharing your data at the end of your project. So how will you preserve it? How will you share it? Where will you share it? Will you share it? Um, what licenses will you use? Who's responsible for your data? So basically it's a document and there are templates about this, um, about data management plans so that you can um, go in and get examples of what kind of questions you should be answering in these plans. Um, but essentially it's a document, you go in and you answer all these questions. So what kind of data do you have? How much data do you have? How much storage do you think you're gonna need? Are you just gonna need a few gigabytes of storage or are you gonna need a couple terabytes of storage? Um, so you kind of go through, answer all these questions, um, and then you get a living document at the end that you can modify as changes occur during your project. Um, so this is what I'm talking about when the policy says that DMPs are going to be needed. It's this living document that you create at the beginning of your project that needs to go in with your grant application to say how you're going to deal with your data throughout the project. Um, there is another presentation in this series that is on data management plans specifically um, and how to fill those out. And they're going to be going over some tools you can use to create data management plans. So I believe that is on October 21st. Um, and Louise can pop the link into the chat there to register for that session if you would like to. That will be a great session because it's um, a data management plan can seem overwhelming, but it's really not that bad. These are a lot of things that you already think about, you're already doing. You just need to write it down and kind of formalize it a little bit. So and another way to make your data fair is to think about where are you going to put it at the end of your project? Are you going to put it into a repository? If you're going to put it into a repository, what kind of repository? The best um, and most applicable repository to put it in and the one that would reach people in your field the most would be a discipline specific repository. So there are loads and loads of different discipline specific repositories. Um, there's just a few examples here. SIMBAD is an astronomical data repository for astronomy data. Um, eCrystals is for um, X-ray structures of crystals. GitHub would be for code that you might write. And Dryad is for biological and some medical research, medical sciences research. Um, you may have heard of some of those. There is a source called re3data.org that you can go to and search for disciplinary specific data verse or data repositories, sorry. Um, and Louise can pop the link in for re3data.org into the chat there. So these are just a few of them um, and there's loads that you might want to use. There are also general data repositories, things like Zenodo you may have heard of, and that kind of takes any kind of, of data sets. Um, there are also institutional repositories. Um, most research institutions will have an institutional data repository if you want to store your data there. Um, a lot of the repositories in Atlantic Canada or a lot of the universities and colleges in Atlantic Canada use what's called Dataverse, um, which is kind of, a, a, it's a data repository, but there's a network of Dataverse users across Canada. So we all kind of, um, the administrators of these data repositories chat with each other and help each other out on issues relating to Dataverse and things like that. Um, there is also a presentation on repositories, more specifically, how to use them, what they're for, how to find them. And there will be a demonstration, I believe, of data of using Dataverse. Um, and I believe that one is on November 3rd. And Louise can pop the link in to register for that database into the chat there. Another thing you might see when you're going to publish articles in journals, a lot of journals now require data sharing statements. So they're saying, yeah, your data has to be open or your data doesn't have to be open, but you have to tell researchers how they can get access to your data or how they can talk to someone about the data if they can't actually access it. 
So a lot of journals are now requiring that you give a data sharing statement saying where your data can be found or how a researcher can talk to you about talking about the data. So, oops, uh, sorry. So two of the main repositories in Canada, like I said, are the Dataverse project. It actually came out of Harvard, but um, Scholars Portal in Ontario kind of took over uh, the Canadian version of Dataverse. Now there are other Dataverse instances. I know UB, UNB has their own instance of Dataverse that's not part of the Scholars Portal one. Um, but if you Google Scholars Portal Dataverse, you will find data repositories for many, many universities across Canada, and you'll be able to search those data sets. FURTER is the Federated Research Data Repository of Canada, and that's kind of for really big data sets um, or data sets that you're not really sure where they should go. Maybe they can go in there, and that's for Canadian data sets. Um, FURTER also searches all of the Canadian data repositories. So it searches all of those data verses and it also searches a number of the disciplinary repositories um, that are Canadian specific, like the Polar Data Catalog has um, basically a ton of data sets about research in the north. Um, so that would all be searchable via FURTER and you can just Google FURTER to take a look at FURTER. So great, now you know why you should manage your research data, a little bit about some of the best practices, but you're probably not gonna walk away right now thinking, okay, great, I know how to do all this, because there are a lot of tools and training resources that you can avail of um, and that you might want to avail of before you embark on this kind of thing. So Canada has actually put a lot of investments into research data management and the digital research strategy for Canada. You might be familiar with the term Endrio, which used to be the New Digital Research Infrastructure Organization. Uh, it has recently changed its name to the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, or the Alliance for short. And that covers um, advanced research computing in Canada. So things like Compute Canada and ACENET. Um, it covers research software, and it also covers research data management. The research data management portion of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada right now is an organization called Portage that may be changing its name soon with this new name change for the Alliance as well. But essentially Portage is a group of people that came out of Endrio and um, CARL, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, and they got together and they said, you know what, we need a lot of national resources for people to support researchers in research data management. So they have a number of training resources. And Louise, if you wouldn't mind putting in the link to Portage in the chat, um, I hope this will let me. Can you see the um, website? It didn't come up, did it? OK. Um, so essentially, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the resources that they have here. Uh, Portage has tons and tons of training resources. And if you go to their page and click on training resources or tools and resources and then training resources, you can see that there are a number of brief guides and primers, training modules, videos, webinars on all kinds of different topics in research data management. They also have a thing called the DMP assistant, and that's what Louise and Aaron will be talking to you about on the 21st. That's kind of an assistant, a tool to help you create a data management plan. Um, there are also um, data management plan exemplars and templates there. There's metadata guidance, there's repository guidance, there's guidance on um, sensitive data tools. So how figuring out if your data is sensitive, if it's low, medium or high risk and what to do with it. If it is high risk, how do you manage that? What extra precautions do you have to take? That kind of thing. So those are some of the national training resources. There are also local training resources. Um, there are a lot of different guide pages, so probably your institution probably has a guide on research data management with contacts for the library. Um, and a lot of institutions in Atlantic Canada have research data management librarians that can act as a conduit between you and the people or the resources you need to manage your data. So they might be able to put you in touch with um, people that deal with high computing projects or high computing research in, in your institution, 
Um, they might be able to put you in touch with the right IT people to figure out how you can um, store your research data, but collaborate on that data with someone outside of your institution, but still keep that data secure. Um, you might need to talk to someone about how to create a data management plan. So you can talk to your research data management librarian about all of these things. And if they don't know the answer, they will put you in touch with someone who does. Um, there are also a number of guides that people have. So this is the Memorial University Libraries Research Data Management Guide. So you can see there's lots of information here about data management plans, best practices, citing data, sharing data, ethics, um, and then our memorial specific resources. Most of your institutions will have one of these. This is the data management guide from Dalhousie University. Um, and I'm sure their contact information is here somewhere. Probably Louise Gillis's contact information is on this page. Um, this is the one from the UNB libraries. I just tried to pick one from each province in the Atlantic Canada in Atlantic Canada. Um, and they're all going to look a little bit different. And this is the UPEI one. Um, so the main point here is it's a good idea to plan out how you're going to manage your research data at the very beginning of your project. You don't have to stick with um, exactly what you plan to do. That management plan is a living document and you can change it, but you just want to document what you're doing so that you have a good record of what you're doing. Everyone on your team understands the data and knows what to do with it and knows what you want done with it. And also contact your library. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, they can put you in touch with the right people or provide you with the right resources that you're going to want to use for data management. So I was told, I know that was kind of a brief overview of the basics of data management. There's a lot more about this. I could talk for hours on this, uh, but I was told I had to leave time for questions as well. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, how do I do that? Oh, there we go. I think I stopped sharing my screen. So now I'll take oh. any questions. No, wait, I'm on the screen. That's not meant to happen. <laughs> You're still sharing, Allison. Oh, I am? Uh, there we go. Okay, now I'm not? Now you're not. That's okay. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can add them in the chat panel. And I see that there's already a few there. Um, so... Let's see what we've got. Um, a question from Karen. Do you need to have participant consent to store de-identified data in a repository? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, uh, one of the resources that many of those guides will have on them is kind of language for informed consent letters at the beginning of your project. Um, and that is one of the reasons that it's really important to do this planning at the very beginning of your project, because if you go out and collect a bunch of data and you don't tell your participants that you're going to be sharing it, you can't share it. They haven't given you permission to do that, so you can't really do that. Now, there's a lot of different language you could put in a consent form, um, but if you're going to store or share that de-identified data, you should tell them that right up front in the informed consent letter that they're signing. Yeah. Uh, the second question, this one's from Joyce. Is there overlap between holdings listed in Furter and Scholars Portal Dataverse? Sort of. <laughs> so um, a lot, the data would be stored in the Scholars Portal Dataverse or in Furter. It's only stored in one of those places. But Furter is also a federated search. So if you go and search Furter, you're going to find their records uh, from Scholars Portal, and then that will link you out to a Scholars Portal Dataverse. Yeah, that was really well described. Um, OK, uh, another question coming in from Joel. Do you know of any RDM resources specific to qualitative data? So for example, interview recordings, transcripts, field notes, video. So much of what is out there presumes quantitative data. Thanks. Yes, that is absolutely true. Um, I think a lot of this stuff was thought of at first for quantitative data. Um, there are a number of 
exemplars for DMPs, and I know one of them is for mixed methods uh, studies that includes qualitative uh, research. So there are a lot of different templates of those data management plans that ask different questions. So some of them will pertain to um, asking questions about interviews or audio transcripts. Some of them will ask questions about, you know, the data you collected might have come from an archive. So where, what was the source of each of those different uh, data sources? So which archives did you get it from? Is that data yours or um, can you just link to that archive to show that's where you got your data? Um, so yes, there are resources specific to qualitative data, mainly in those DMP templates um, that you will be able to find in the DMP assistant. And I believe Louise and Aaron will be going over that in the October 21st yeah. session. Yeah, we will make sure to make a point of highlighting the different templates and the exemplars that are available, because as Allison said, they Portage as an organization has made a real effort to make sure they're covering a wide variety of study sorts and just yes yeah. yeah and that's a good point louise besides the templates for the questions that should be asked there are also some exemplars of those which are really good examples of already completed data management plans that you could take a look at um, you can you know if you're doing a history one i know there's one about there about um interviews with uh acadian french settlers i believe or something like that or belgian french settlers something like that I don't remember the exact title right now, um, but so you can take a look and see how that was written and say, oh, right, okay, I have to be sure to include information about all this kind of stuff that they've included. Okay, okay questions keep coming. So another one from Joyce, is de-identification necessary if you don't plan to make your data open? So that one, I guess, is up to you and how you're storing your data. So it really depends on the security of your data there. If you don't have or if you have data that has identifiable information about people or endangered species or any type of sensitive data like that, financial information, health information, anything like that, you have to make sure that you're storing it in a way that um, is secure and follows all of your university policies and your ethics board policies. Um, a lot of the stuff overlaps with ethics applications. So they kind of have a say on where you have to store that kind of data. But if you don't plan to make your data open, it's fine to um, not de-identify your data as long as your data is stored in a location that is applicable to that non-de-identified data. Okay, um, and another question coming in, this one from Susan, is there a standard length of time for data storage, like for tax documents? Uh, data formats and programs change, I've been at this for quite a while. <laughs> yes, data formats and programs definitely change. That's one of the reasons that we um, suggest storing your data in non-proprietary formats rather than proprietary formats, because um, there's lots of instances where you might have a data set or a data file, um, and then that software becomes obsolete, and there's no way to read it. So like take floppy disks. You know, If you have your data stored on a floppy disk, who can read that now? I don't know if I've seen a computer that can take a floppy disk in 15 years. Um, so you have to make sure that you do um, store it in a format that will be able to be read uh, for a long time to come. Um, there's not really a standard length of time for data storage unless you have a policy at your uh, own institution or if you're following specific requirements of specific grants. So I know, for example, for SHRC grants, um, they have a, a clause in there that you have to retain your store, your data for all time. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how feasible that is, but that's what it says in the policy. Um, or they might say for a, a, an appropriate amount of time. So what does that mean? Um, so I know at Memorial, we have to store our research data for five years past the end of a research project. Um, and keep it safe and secure. So that's one of the things that you would address in your data management plan. You would talk about retention periods. So you might have told your participants that the data will be destroyed after five years. So if you've told them that, you have to make sure that you have a schedule set up to make sure that you destroy that data in five years. Um, you might decide this is really, really important data and it's gonna be super important in 50 years. So you might wanna make sure that that data gets archived after a certain amount of time. Um, so that's really up to you, but keeping in mind the policies that are at your own institution 
and the requirements of whatever grant you have gotten to do the research. Yeah, so yes, um, and just to add to what Allison said, just really stressing that it will vary institution by institution, funder by funder. So unfortunately, no, there's no standard length of time for data storage. Uh, it, grant uh, facilitators at your institution can help you determine what the requirements of each uh, funder are for that. Absolutely. Um, Lorreen, what migration plan, oh, sorry, would migration plans be part of the DMP? Yes, for sure. So the DMP is going to ask you what you're doing with your data during the active phase. So how are you storing it when it's just you and your team that are accessing it? It's going to ask about um, where you plan to store it long term for preservation, whether that be open or not. Um, and it's going to ask you if you plan to uh, archive it or if you plan to destroy it. Yes, you should answer all of those questions in the data management plan. It's basically just like a research proposal, but for your data. That's right. All right, um, Holly, if data comes from public sources, so for example, blogs, are there any issues regarding de-identification? If so, how would this work? OK, so that one, I believe, is a better question for an ethics board. But um, I know that I just recently did some research where I gathered public uh, information that I just uh, took from discussion forums online. And there were no ethical concerns about that because it's already out there. It's already public. Um, so with mine, and I can't speak for everyone else's, but with my data, I took it from public health forums. So like um, babycenter.com, I took the discussion forum information. Um, and I did not look at de-identifying it because ethics told me there's no problem with that because anyone on the internet can find that data and look at it. I didn't include usernames or anything like that, um, but uh, if it's from public sources and it's already published, I don't think you should have a problem. But you would want to check with your ethics board for sure. Yeah, that's an ethics board question as well. Okay. Allison, you've received so many questions. I think that's a strong indication that the topic really interested people and um, got people thinking. So were there any more? We have a few minutes left. And keep in mind, this is a, a complicated topic, but don't let it overwhelm you. You can always go and talk to someone at your library or in IT. Um, probably the library, they'll put you in the right direction um, and they'll help you with this. Uh, it's an overwhelming thing, but you can do it and start small. You know, if you don't know the answer to a question in a data management plan, say, I don't know the answer yet, and then we can help you figure it out. Um, so there's lots of other great sessions in this uh, webinar series. Um, and Louise just posted the link to register for those webinars in the uh, chat box there. Aside from the data management planning presentation and the Dataverse or rep data repositories presentation. There's also one on using ACENET. So that's like high performance computing um, using Compute Canada through your institution. Yes, and for those of you who prefer um, a session in French, it was late to the offerings, but we um, do have a French lineup as well. And it's the same topics, but just delivered by, um, by our French colleague. So um, you can register for those at the link as well. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.